Hey, it's episode 251, and today we're chatting about... It's really hard to pinpoint exactly what we're going to be talking about because there's so many things. It's a Q&A episode. I'm answering a bazillion and one questions, all your questions. We're talking about hydration, nuts, harmful additives, a whole bunch of stuff. So hold tight. I'm excited. Are you? So if you listen to today's episode and you're like, dang, I want Leanne to answer a question of mine, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact, submit your question. Kevin gets the questions and he makes them all look beautiful, puts them in a document for me. And then after a couple weeks slash months, whenever I'm able to get to it and record an episode, your question goes up on the show. <sighs> everyone's screaming, yay, right, right. I'm pretty excited. It's been a hot minute since I created a Q&A episode. Now, if you want to go even deeper into all things keto and empower yourself, because I feel like that was a major theme of today's questions of just like feeling a little bit timid to empower yourself over your health. I wrote a book. It's called Keto for Women. And if you're a woman on keto, I feel like I need it. You can find out more details by going to ketodietbook.com. It's in most bookstores as well, but ketodietbook.com will show you where you can get it. You can also catch up on previous podcast episodes and notes from today's show by going to ketodietpodcast.com. Okay, let's do this thing. Hey, I'm Leanne Vogel, and you're listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. I've put together a free 21-page guide on achieving weight loss on your keto diet if nothing is working as a little thank you for being here today. Grab your free guide at ketoforwomen.com to get the steps you need to overcome the hurdles standing in your way. First question is from Sherry. Good morning, Leanne. My question is, I just had my gallbladder removed two weeks ago. My surgeon and I talked about keto and he said I could eat the same as it's pretty much trial and error. As a nutritionist, what do you recommend? Thank you for your time. Stay safe. Stay well. I am a healthy 55-year-old woman. Okay, so a big tip for you, Sherry, is that... Anytime you want to find stuff, and this goes for all of you, if you're looking for whether or not I've done things on the past about something that you're experiencing, you can just go to Google and type in healthful pursuit and then the thing that you're looking for. So healthful pursuit gallbladder or healthful pursuit kidney or healthful pursuit chocolate cake or anything. So if you just go into Google and type healthful pursuit and then the thing you're looking for, Google will show you all the things that relate to your question as per whatever is on Healthful Pursuit. So in your case, if you just go to Google and type in Healthful Pursuit Gallbladder, you're going to find three resources. Now I'm going to explain each of these and then tell you what I would do if I were in your situation. The first is going to be an ox bile supplement. <sighs> it blows me away that your surgeon did not talk to you about ox bile. Ugh, it's, it just grinds my gears a lot. So let me tell you a little bit about, no, first I'm going to tell you the three resources and then we'll get into the things. The, th the second resource you're going to find when you Google Healthful Pursuit Gallbladder is going to be podcast 71 on the Keto Diet Podcast where we talked about gallbladder removal. And the third is going to be a video I did way back in 2015, which is still very relevant. I just watched it and holy moly, have I aged a lot in five years. <laughs> if anything, just go to the Google machine and type in healthful pursuit gallbladder and see what I looked like in 2015 for a video all about gallbladder, fat digestion issues, everything to do with fat digestion on a ketogenic diet. Okay, let's rewind a little bit and talk about what happens when we eat fat on the ketogenic diet. So I'm going to simplify it a lot here. Basically, our liver creates something called bile, and that bile is used to break down fats. Now, that bile is stored in our, our gallbladder. So when we remove our gallbladder, we no longer have bile storage. So yes, we can still make bile, but it has to be used up fairly quickly. Otherwise, our body just gets rid of it, and then we, we just don't have any storage. Now, when you don't have a gallbladder and you're eating a very high-fat diet, it can take the liver a little while to ramp up its production to help you create bile so that you can break down fats. This is why it blows me away that surgeons who remove gallbladders never recommend that their clients just get some bile. So you can supplement with ox bile 
Now, again, if you just Google healthful pursuit gallbladder, you're going to find that ox bile that I recommend. And just taking that with each meal as per the recommendations on the bottle, it'll say that generally speaking, you're going to feel so much better. So that's the first piece is supplementation. The next piece is encouraging your liver to produce bile. Now, my personal favorite, and it might not be yours, but let's hope, is sauerkraut juice. Um, They actually make sauerkraut. I think it's farmhouse culture makes actual sauerkraut juice, like just the liquid from sauerkraut. And that ramps up my bile production. Oh, baby. So you can give that a try and see how it works. But those are like the main two things. Oh, actually, there's a third. You might want to reduce your fat intake even just slightly. So let's say you're at 70% fat, going down to like 55, 60%, just taking it easy. You might also find that like super high fat meals, such as like fat bombs with a fatty coffee is just too much and actually like hurts or the fat goes right through you. Like you eat a fatty coffee and literally 30 minutes later, you're pooing out oil like that's not excreting oil I guess I could say that's not awesome okay so if that's happening ox bile is really important chat with perhaps your doctor a registered nutritionist that can work with you one-on-one is very helpful but generally speaking these three recommendations that I've made for you are going to go probably a pretty long way to making you feel great after your surgery I hope that helped Sherry Homemade or store-bought, I love cookies. Always have and always will. And my husband, Kevin, loves them even more. My aunt calls him the cookie monster for good reason. He's a lean, mean, cookie-eating machine, and he'll eat up any cookie, regardless of the ingredients. We keep all sorts of keto cookies in the house, for real, like four different brands at all times, but Kevin always devours the super fat cookies the very first, always. Doesn't matter what other brands, if there is a bag of super fat cookies in the house, whether it be chocolate chip or snicker or doodle, he will find it and he will eat it. Instead of inflammatory fats and loads of sugar, you can find ingredients like almond flour, coconut flour, grass-fed butter, grass-fed collagen in super fat cookies. They come in three different flavors, chocolate chip, snickerdoodle, and peanut butter chocolate chip. There's a flavor for every cookie connoisseur. I'm allergic to dairy, so I haven't been able to try them. I know it's a total bummer. So I trust my cookie monster husband's endorsement. I'll stick to super fat nut butter packets instead, but he's got his cookie game sorted. Load up on cookies or fat packs by heading to superfat.com and using the coupon code LEANNE, all in caps, at checkout for 15% off your whole order. Again, that's superfat.com with the coupon code LEANNE, L-E-A-N-N-E, at checkout for 15% off your order. Enjoy! Okay, question number two. I'm going to stop uh, numbering questions. Otherwise, I'm totally going to screw that up. So next question is from Leah. I'm very new to keto, but I love what you're doing and I'm pretty addicted to your podcast. Oh, thanks, Leah. I'm pretty addicted to your nice awesomeness. I just have one request. You talk about thyroid issues, but unfortunately, almost exclusively about hypothyroidism. I've got Graves disease, autoimmune hyperthyroid on and off since 10 years. I'm 28 and I'm just as frustrated with traditional medicine. The pills make me feel horrible and so on and so on. I would love to hear more about hyperthyroid and keto from you, please. Thank you. Okay, Leah, the reason a lot of keto people don't talk about hyperthyroid on keto is that there's really no trick to it. The beautiful thing about keto for hyperthyroid is that it just does what it's supposed to do. So as far as I know, and with clients that I've worked with and people that I've met, when you're hyperthyroid and you go on keto, that's the thing that makes it all come together. So it's pretty straightforward. I wish that I could offer like a one, two, three step, but really, if you just eat keto, now quote unquote keto can mean a lot of different things for a lot of people. If your main concern is hyperthyroid, you're likely going to do really Really great on a standard ketogenic protocol where your fat intake is around 70 to 75 percent, your protein is about 15 percent, and your carbs are about 5 percent, give or take. It's really straightforward. Keto pretty much does all it needs to do in that regard. So that's why a lot of people don't bring it up because if you just eat keto, it's great for hyperthyroid. I hope that really helps, Leah. And thank you so, so much for listening to the show and submitting your question. It means a lot. 
Okay, next question is from Anna. I've been listening to your podcast for a while and it's been a real source of support for me physically and emotionally. So thanks for doing what you're doing. I've had bad anxiety, IBS and HPV that is not cleared for a couple of years. I think maybe I should get my gut biome tested as well as a vitamin panel, but I don't know which resources to trust. Do you have any recommendations? Do I ever, Anna? I was treated with HPV when I was 17. At the time, I had no idea what it was. And I tested positive for HPV for the first eight years after my surgery. And oh, that was a really frustrating time. And as soon as I started understanding nutrition, I started understanding how important B vitamins are for the health of our entire body. And I started supplementing with a B complex, a 100 B complex, as well as eating so much nutritional yeast that I got sick of it for years afterward. And after one year of supplementing with B complex, and I'm sure cleaning up my eating style really helped getting out in the sun more really helped all those things, getting vitamin IVs, which I'm going to talk about. But the main thing that I feel like really assisted me was a B complex and the nutritional yeast. B vitamins are so, so important. Um, when it comes to HPV. Now, vitamin IVs are really, really great when we're experiencing anxiety. It helps with IBS too for me, my muscle spasms that I experience often and the pain that I experience going up my spine is always assisted when I get a vitamin IV. Let me explain what a vitamin IV is. Basically, you find a doctor like a good one that will shoot you up And by shoot you up, I mean they connect you to an IV and it takes like two-ish to four-ish hours to pump you full of vitamins. And you get to choose your cocktail. Now, some... Some doctors will only offer what they call a Myers cocktail um, and other doctors offer a bunch of different things. I recently just had a vitamin cocktail that had all the minerals, a ton of vitamin C, a glutathione push at the end where they add a glutathione to a needle and inject it um, rather quickly, whereas the IV drip is like over a longer period of time. I also did methylcobalamin, which is B12, all the Bs. Um, what else did I put in there? Vitamin D. I feel like I'm probably missing something. But when you work with a doctor, they'll usually be able to recommend, or I would hope that they would be able to recommend what might be best for you. And I only say that because you have a mixture of different symptoms, anxiety, IBS, HPV, and especially with IBS and anxiety, at least for me, my experience with both of these has been that they're very intertwined. When I'm anxious, my bowels are acting up. And when I'm nervous, my bowels are doing something completely different. Um, So you might find a lot of benefit to vitamin IVs. And this really ties in line with your question of like, how do I find the right care and how do I know what to test for and whatnot? You really need to find a doctor. So if you go to a chiropractor, like a good chiropractor, chiropractors know what's up. They know people. They know doctors. I've never met a chiropractor that I didn't like. Um, So chiropractors generally know doctors in the area that have vitamin IVs. And generally speaking, if a doctor offers Myers cocktails or something even stronger with vitamin IVs, or they know that methylcobalamin vitamin B12 shots are better than the other one that's totally garbage. Like if you just ask, what's your vitamin b12 shot shot if they don't say methylcobalamin they're garbage hang up (laughs) so chiropractors generally know as do acupuncturists i find anytime i go to a new city and i don't know anyone i just go on google look for the best acupuncturist that specializes in women's hormones and i go there i have a session and i ask her it's always been a lady I ask her like, hey, do you know any doctors that do vitamin IV pushes or any doctors that specialize in hormones? Guaranteed they always know. So that's a great first step. But you can also call around to holistic doctors and just ask them like, do you do IV pushes? Do you test for this, that and the other thing? Can you do bioidentical hormones? Are you familiar with HPV? What are your protocols on da, 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 da? And you could just ask them. It's so, so, so important, especially if they're not willing to answer your questions over the phone. I'm not willing to spend the time to go into the doctor's office and meet the doctor. If they say stuff like, well, why don't you just come in for a consultation so we can answer your question then? I'm like, no, I'm not interested. I don't have time to waste. And I really want to find a doctor that's right for me. So you can say those things and you can ask those questions. 
Now, another route that you could take is putting your health in your own hands. Now, I've done this for quite some time where I use Everly Well for testing all my own stuff. Now, they do not do gut biome testing, so um, that's something to keep in mind, but they have a whole bunch of different tests. Now, Everly Well is going to be, generally speaking, more expensive than getting your blood panels through a doctor, so just keep this in mind. Now, if you go to healthfulpursuit.com slash well, and use the coupon code KETO, you're going to get 15% off your order on any Everly Well at home test kits. So what you do with Everly Well is you basically go to their website, figure out what tests you want, and then order them and put in that keto coupon code. Um, and then once you've ordered it, the kit actually shows up at your front door. It's going to ask you for a couple samples depending on the type of kit that you've ordered. Um, so I've done samples of saliva. I've done samples of blood. Have I, I've done urine, I feel like. Is that all? I'm sure there's more. But with the blood, you're thinking, no way could I poke myself with a needle. You don't have to. You prick your finger, okay, and you just drop a drop of blood on a piece of testing paper, and that's it. Mind-blowing. It's available for you. Again, that's healthfulpursuit.com slash well. Use a coupon code KETO for 15% off. Now, once you get those results, Everly Well does have a service that you can call into and book an appointment and have somebody review the lab work with you. I didn't love this experience with Everly Well. As a practitioner that really understands these numbers and things and panels, I felt like the person on the phone was just trained to say, it's normal, it's low, it's high. And that's all they're able to say. They can't offer any insight into what you should do or what it should look like. They just basically tell you how to read your own results. I found it to be kind of a waste of time. But if you're brand new to reading your own results, it's a really, really good intro. They'll explain what TSH is and how the thyroid works. So it's really good in that regard if you're new with all of this. And then once you have those results, you can look for a doctor. That's another option. Another option for you, uh, Anna, is to grab Happy Keto Body. If you go to happyketobody.com, this is my 12-week keto program for women. And if you get the VIP option, you receive lifetime VIP calls with our doctor on staff, Dr. Nina Lewis Larson. So once a month, all of our members submit questions, blood work, all sorts of things. And Dr. Nina goes through them on the call and answers all questions. So that's another option for you as well. But if you're specifically looking for testing, I think you're going to have the most benefit by finding a doctor in your area. Call around to the clinics, ask the questions, and I'm excited for you to get started. I really hope you're enjoying today's episode. I'd love to see where you're listening from. You can snap a pic and tag me at Leanne Vogel or leave a review for the show on your favorite podcast player. It helps me out tremendously. Okay, back to the good stuff. Okay, next question is from Taylor. Hi, Leanne. I've bought all your books and listened to all your podcasts religiously at work. Oh, thanks, Taylor. I do have two questions. I have heard on one of your podcasts that you mentioned pea protein. What are your thoughts on pea protein with a ketogenic diet? Also, I have vegan Shakeology and really enjoy it, but I'm curious as to your thoughts on that as well. I follow Beachbody workouts and enjoy those too. Taylor, I like Beachbody workouts too. Aren't they so fun? I'm friends with Shaleen Johnson, which blows me away because I used to follow her workouts all the time. And I remember uh, my sister came for visits and I was like, one day I'm going to be friends with Shaleen. And she is such an amazing human being and just so, so, so great. If you don't follow her on Instagram, you must. And a lot of her beach body workouts are just so fabulous. Okay. So to get back to your question, pea protein. Now I personally don't use pea protein and I don't recommend pea protein. Now, there's a caveat to this because my husband, Kevin, massively needs protein. He does collagen, but he gets really bored of it often. And so I've been supplementing uh, for him with the Four Sigmatic protein and it's a vegan protein and it does have pea protein. Now he hasn't reacted to it. So I've just been giving it to him, but understand that pea protein powder, it's pretty well tolerated by most people and usually has pretty few side effects. It's made by isolating the protein from peas. So it's pretty low in fiber and doesn't tend to cause like 
gassiness or bloating like a whole pea would. I do have concerns over lectins in pea protein. I haven't been able to find any actual evidence on whether or not it does have lectins, but I would imagine that any plant based protein powder would have lectins and probably in a concentrated form. So if you're concerned about overall gut health and any of the protein powders that you're using have any sort of plant protein, I kind of like to stay away from it. Um, there are some plant proteins that I'm kind of okay with, including hemp and pumpkin seed protein, but I think that's just about it. So um, yeah, if you don't have any concerns over gut health, I would say that pea protein powder is probably okay. But also just protein powder in general, I mean, I'm really of the belief, uh, maybe because I studied this for so long, that the whole food is always best. So although I think it would be disgusting to make a shake with steak in it, <laughs> you know, sometimes we like shakes and they're way better with protein powder than they would be with a piece of chicken in it. But you could also use whole foods like eggs if you're cool with it. Um, in Kevin's shakes sometimes, I'm pretty sensitive to eggs now, um, but in Kevin's shakes sometimes I'll add raw egg right in there. If you're comfortable with that, uh, I haven't killed my husband yet, so all is well. Um, but I feel like it's so much better to get whole food sources of protein than constantly relying on all this other stuff. And this always goes for collagen too. Um, recently I switched over from using a lot of collagen in my smoothies and coffees and all the things to using bone broth. So instead of my fatty coffees, I do fatty bone broth. Instead of using milk in my smoothies, I use bone broth. And by the time you add all the fruits and all the things, I personally don't taste the broth in my smoothie. So give that a try and see how it goes. Okay, Lisa has a question. Uh, thank you so, so much for your podcast. I've loved, loved listening to you. Thanks, Lisa. Oh gosh, you guys are so sweet today. You've been super helpful to me on learning about my body. I've recently been introducing more fasting into my routine, and I'm just wondering if it's normal to still poop on day two of a fast. Thank you again for all that you do and all the wonderful content that you bring out on your podcasts. Oh, thanks, Lisa. It means so much because it's been a little bit nerve wracking to be um, hosting guests in the way that we switched over to it a couple of months ago. And this is only because I live full time on the ocean and there are sometimes weeks, ugh, often months where I don't have good enough internet connection to interview people. And I still wanted to have people on the show. And so I thought, hey, why not have people take over the show and they could totally bring their spice to it. So I'm glad that you're enjoying the show as it's transitioned to this new kind of uh, outline. So that means a lot. Now, pooping on day two of a fast. I am so jealous of you. I think that's great. Yeah. I mean, food's going to stay in our system, depending on how quick your digestive system is anywhere from 24. I mean, ideally it's 24 hours, but some of us it's like 48, 72. I mean, ideally if you eat a whack load of beets at lunch on a Wednesday, you want all that to be through and out of your poo by Thursday at lunchtime. But sometimes that just, just isn't optimal. So yeah, if you're still pooing on day two, I mean, that's awesome. I feel like. Um, so thanks again for listening, Lisa, and enjoy experimenting with fasting. I can't wait to see how it goes for you. Okay, next question is from Leslie. I ordered the CBD oil at your recommendation and it has arrived, but I don't know how to take it. I don't know when. I'm anxious to eat too much keto food and have trouble sleeping and pooing. Hey, Leslie. Okay. Yeah. It's a total valid concern to be worried about overdoing it on fat when you start, because I know at least for me, when I started keto, I was like fats and I went too hard too quickly and got pretty sick. So you don't really have to worry about that with CBD oil because it's such a, like, it's a pretty low dose that you're taking. Um, if you're concerned about or interested in CBD oil and you want to learn a whole bunch more, actually episode 248 of the show, it launched us a couple of weeks ago, we talked all about CBD oil and I've offered so many guidelines and recommendations there. Now, personally with CBD oil, 
I just take it under the tongue in the morning. So as soon as I wake up, I take my thyroid meds. I meditate when I get back upstairs to make Kevin breakfast because he can't go more than like 20 minutes awake without eating something. (laughs) Ah, progress. It'll slowly take time. I'm not frustrated. You're frustrated. (laughs) Just kidding. We both take the CBD oil under our tongue before we start the day. Now, I was doing that for a while, but I found that because CBD oil makes me so like chill. I wasn't getting much done in the day. So I've started to take my CBD oil in the evening, um, usually after dinner, sometime around six or seven. So that I'm like slowly calming down before I go to bed. How much you take is really up to you. I always recommend starting slow and low and working yourself up. So if the CBD oil you're taking, let's just use Eaton Hemp CBD oil because it's my personal favorite. It's the only one I recommend and I've tried a whole bunch. I think so many of them are ripoffs and you're paying like $100 for a subpar oil and you're not feeling anything and all the things. So let's pretend it's Eaton Hemp CBD and that's 17 milligrams per serving in their regular dose or I think it's 50 milligrams per serving in their extra strength dose. Now a dose is one whole dropper. In each vial that you receive, it's 30 servings or 30 droppers. So when it comes to eating hemp CBD, you could start off maybe with regular dose, half of the dropper, put it under your tongue um, right around dinner time. See how you feel. Do that for a week. Want to increase it? Cool. Increase it. I haven't met anyone that's really needed anything more than extra strength at 50 milligrams a day. However, it wouldn't surprise me if there's a human out there that does like 200 milligrams and they feel really great on it. It would get pretty expensive and I don't think it's really necessary. Even their extra strength, I mean... When I first started using Eat and Hemp, they're like, yeah, like just note the extra strength is 50 milligrams. And I'm like, no big deal. I take 50 milligrams of the other brand. And they're like, yeah, but ours is more potent. I'm like, Pff. and I took 50 milligrams of their extra strength uh, CBD oil. And holy moly, that stuff is strong. It was like four times stronger than the stuff I was on before. So I find I don't actually need that much, but just start slow and low and Try to do it in the evening. Now Kevin takes it in the morning. It doesn't affect him at all. So you just got to kind of go with it and see how it goes. Enjoy, Leslie. I think you're going to love CBD oil, and I'd love to know how you enjoy it as you start to supplement with it. Next question is from Sharon. I recently had my cholesterol levels checked, and they were higher than they've ever been. I've been following the ketogenic diet for the last seven weeks and have lost 10 pounds, but have been at a plateau for three weeks. My question is, how much effect on cholesterol level does the ketogenic diet have overall? Sharon, great question. And as we learn more and more about how cholesterol works, what it does, what we're looking for, all the things, um, the rules are changing. And I mean, really, if you look at all the papers, even back in the 1970s, they were starting to show that total cholesterol isn't really the number you want to go for overall. And unfortunately, when we go to our doctor, the first thing they look at is our total cholesterol. And they get very concerned when our total cholesterol has risen. And unfortunately, that's just an a stupid way. (laughs) I can't come up with the word other than stupid Uh, way of looking at cholesterol. So there are so many different uh, factors that you need to look at. The most, most, most important is your triglycerides. Now, personally, I try to keep my triglycerides at a ratio below one when I look at the ratio between HDL and triglycerides. Okay. So that's what we really want to be looking at is How many triglycerides to HDL do we have? And then LDL, although it's been labeled the bad cholesterol, I don't worry about it too much. Now, there are people out there that have a genetic predisposition to their cholesterol raising when they supplement with saturated fat. So if you are one of those people, what's going to happen when you go on the ketogenic diet and you're having a lot of saturated fat, usually in the form of MCT oil, coconut oil, butter, think of any fats other than MCT because it's a, I don't want to say man created oil, but it's definitely been tampered with. If you just think of any fats that are solid at room temperature, like tallow, duck fat, all those things, chicken fat, 
they're going to be pretty solid at room temperature. When we're having those fats and we have that genetic disposition, what's going to happen is that our cholesterol is going to increase. Is this a good thing? Probably not. Now, I don't personally have that genetic trait. I tested my genes a couple of years ago, found out that's not a concern for me, but my sister tested and it is a concern for her. So when she's eating the ketogenic diet and she eats a ton of saturated fat, her cholesterol is going really high. And in fact, her body does better with that genetic disposition. Her body does better at a lower cholesterol level. Now, if you're like, I want to know what this is. I want to know what my levels are. You have to get a uh, DNA test kit. And then once you've done the DNA test kit, you want to go to Found My Fitness. Uh, Rhonda Kirkpatrick, I think it's Kirkpatrick or Rhonda Patrick, I'm not sure, has a app on her website that allows you to upload the raw data that you receive from your genetic test and upload it to her site and she'll give you a lot more information. Now, I don't know the legal complexities of all this and where your information is shared or stored. So you're going to need to look into that and make a decision for yourself. But I felt like it was worth it. And it totally was. And I loved it so, so much. And I'm so happy that I know that when my cholesterol increases, I don't worry at all. And I don't care. But when my sister's does, it's usually a good sign that she's eating too much saturated fat. You know what I love more than anything in the entire world is helping people. And when I meet a complete stranger and they're telling me about symptoms that they're having or symptoms that their dog is having or their loved one, oftentimes the first thing that comes into my head is, you should try CBD oil. And I'm in fact sitting in my car right now. I just drove an hour and a half to a friend's place to drop off a bottle of Eaton Hemp CBD oil. Their dog's having a really difficult time with an inflammatory condition. Nobody knows what it is. And I just thought again, you need to try CBD oil. Now CBD oil has massively reduced my symptoms of anxiety, but CBD oil does so much more including inflammation reduction, improving digestive function, improving sleep quality, reduces acne. But here's what you have to know before you grab a random bottle and start supplementing. Research, research, research your options thoroughly. Look for a CBD oil that uses hemp seed oil as the carrier oil. Now, the hemp seed oil means that the plant has been kept in its purest whole plant form, allowing for the terpenes and cannabinoids to work together in unison in your body to give you the powerful entourage effect that everyone is always raving about when it comes to CBD. Among high-quality CBD options, Eaton Hemp's unfiltered full-spectrum CBD oil is an all-organic choice. Again, all organic choice. They're one of the first unfiltered CBD products to be USDA certified organic. This guarantees what you see is what you get. No toxins, no pesticides, no label trickery. Eaton Hemp uses hemp seed oil as a carrier for CBD, giving you the full entourage effect, maximum absorption, potency, effectiveness, terpenes, cannabinoids, aka results, which is all good things. And if you're like supplementing, how do I even do this? Now, I personally take take a dropper full a day with my dogs up until both our dogs passed away. Lexi was supplementing with 15 milligrams. She's a 60 pound dog and Pebbles, who is a 10 pound dog, did a dropper to a day. Now with our dog Coconut, who's developed a little bit of inflammation, I've started giving her 10 milligrams a day and she's an 80 pound dog. I personally couldn't even imagine my life without CBD. It extended Lexi's life by three years, giving us so much more time to spend together when vets said it wasn't even possible. I cannot tell you how powerful a supplement this has been for me and my family. Now, I chatted with my friends over at Eaton Hemp and they put together a sweet deal for you. If you go to eatonhempcbd.com slash keto diet, again, that's Eaton, E-A-T-O-N, hemp, cbd.com slash keto diet and use the coupon code keto diet. You're going to get 20% off all Eaton hemp CBD products. That includes the salves and all the crazy things you can get into when it comes to CBD. That's 20% off with the code keto diet at eatonhempcbd.com slash keto diet. So I hope that's really helpful for you. Okay. Next up is a question from Elizabeth. Um, hey Leanne, what role can hydration play in keto? I also wanted your take on a product my husband got for me as a gift. It's called Circool. 
I hate drinking water, but with this little water bottle and its flavor cartridges, I am loving drinking water. I was looking up the ingredients and what's in it at uh, drinksarecool.com slash products by clicking on the flavors, blah, blah, blah. I'm not well versed enough to really understand what some of these uh, hidden sugars and yucky chemicals are. I'm hoping that you've heard of this before. Elizabeth, I haven't hadn't heard of it, but I went on their website and found out all about it. Okay. First off, let's just like take a moment to understand that water isn't water when stuff is added. Can we agree? Like Coca-Cola is made with water. My face cream is also made with water, not water, right? So I know it's kind of a jerk thing to say, but it's so, so incredibly true. <laughs> like, so keep that in mind. Like tea is not water. What is water is 100% pure water. Now we can play around with this by like, you know, I add some organic herbs to my water sometimes. Like sometimes I make a cilantro water. Sometimes I make a mint water. Sometimes I add some cucumbers in there, some berries in there. And most time I just drink cold water because it tastes really good. Now, here's another thing about water. A lot of people hate drinking water because they're not drinking the right kind of water. So really be mindful of what kind of water you're drinking, where you're getting that water. Was it stored in plastic? Because the body knows. I cannot stand bottled water. Just the smell of it, the taste of it, holding the bottle, hearing the crunchiness, like it really gets to me. So I, I don't drink a lot of water when I know I'm going to be drinking out of a bottle. Now, full reverse osmosis, delicious water, thankfully, that I have a lot of access to living on a boat and making drinking water from ocean water. It's a long process. Thank goodness we have what we call a water maker that just takes the ocean water out, makes it uh, into reverse osmosis water, and then I add minerals into it afterward. This is the best tasting, most amazing water. It's so tasty. So you just have to find the water that you enjoy and then drink that. Um, now I did, I did look at all the ingredients. So I'm going to list off the ingredients that you should be noting or just aware of that probably aren't that great. Um, so going forward, you know what to look for. And then I'll explain what some of them are. Sucralose, not great. Caffeine, not awesome. Sodium benzoate, also not great. Monopotassium phosphate, also not great. Citric acid, mm natural flavors, which aren't always natural. Um, now, when I looked at the specific product, the, the line that I thought was the most cleanest, if you're just like, Nalian, I'm going to eat this forever. I don't care. Uh, Pure Sips looked the safest, but like they're the safest because they have nothing but what they're calling natural flavors. And I think you could save a lot of money by just putting like herbs and fruits and vegetables into your water. Just a thought. So when it comes to sodium benzoate, um, it may increase your risk of inflammation, oxidative stress, obesity, ADHD, allergies. It may also convert to benzene, which is a carcinogen. Okay, so low levels in beverages have been deemed safe. Uh, and this is a term that drives me crazy even to this day. Uh, generally recognized as safe. Now, the problem with this list is that oftentimes it is uh, well-funded, um, meaning that I have known of companies that have paid um, an exorbitant amount of money to kind of like wean themselves into these certain circumstances. So that's something to be mindful of. Also, a lot of these tests aren't done on people that are drinking eight to 10 bottles of this stuff a day, every day. So keep that in mind. Um, the next ingredient, um, monopotassium phosphate. If you have severe kidney disease, this is massively something that you're going to want to avoid. Or if you have a history of kidney dysfunction in your family, definitely do not even play around with that ingredient. Um, and those are kind of the two that I know about. But like overall, other than the pure sips, I would avoid this product personally yet. No, I wouldn't even do the pure sips, honestly. But if I had to choose one, the pure sips from Sir Cool would be the one that I would choose. Okay, next question from Marina. I have purchased your book, Keto for Women, and I love it. Aw, uh -huh, thanks, Marina. 
not a lot of people love that book. <laughs> I, I'm not sure why. I have great reviews on Amazon and everyone I've talked to loves it, but um, it hasn't done the great at bookstores. So if you're a keto woman and you don't have a copy yet, I think you should get it because Marina likes it and everyone I talk to has really enjoyed it too. You can find more information by going to ketodietbook.com. I have a specific question about the fat fueled profiles. I have had severe reactive hypoglycemia for eight years. I have been paleo for the last six years and started keto about four months ago. Would you suggest a pumped keto profile for me as stated in your book? Also, any tips if you can't track your macros? It's triggering for me due to previous disordered eating. I do low impact workouts every day, bar and Pilates. Marina. Okay, so I've had hypoglycemia, um, reactive hypoglycemia. I had it, I think, for like 13 years, uh, specifically before I went keto. So me personally, as soon as I went keto and I got over that hump that we all do of like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm dying, my transition to keto was not pleasant like at all. And once I got over that, I just stopped having hypoglycemia and I've never experienced anything at all. Like I have not experienced anything since. After those four days of keto, um, that was back in 2014. July 2014. Wow, that's so long ago. That's crazy. I haven't had an issue with it. And I also don't track. So I think with a lot of this like reactive hypoglycemia thing, you know, we're eating carbs, and we get low on carbs, and then our body, you know, we have an experience or an episode, and then we eat more carbs, and then we feel better. And then we have an episode, you know, what I'm saying, so by getting off that hamster wheel, um, we're not having those same episodes, we're not having those same issues, and it's not an issue. So maybe perhaps play around with the idea of not tracking, of setting the intention to eat low carb, high fat, and that might just be enough for you. If I had to choose an eating style for reactive hypoglycemia, knowing my experience, I'd either do pumped keto or classic keto. That's kind of where I'd start. And then once you feel comfortable, you can play around with carb ups, sticking to more whole food based sources like plantains, sweet potatoes, that sort of thing. Um, just be mindful that, you know, you said that you'd been on paleo for a while and it sounded like it didn't help. It didn't help me either. But once I went keto and I stayed on keto for a while, as I started to add back in carbs, it really didn't matter. Um, so I hope that was helpful. Okay, next question is from Kathy. I just purchased your book for a host of reasons, but the biggest issue I'm running into everywhere is the use of almond flour and almonds as a snack. I'm allergic to most nuts. I can eat cashews and pecans, but I don't want to overindulge just in case. I know I can substitute coconut flour, but will I get the same benefits if I'm not utilizing the almond flour? Thank you in advance, Kathy. Okay, there's no real benefit to almond flour. In fact, like... Almond flour, it's not that it's bad for you, but you're not going to, you're not really getting anything from almond flour. So don't be worried about cutting it out of your life. I think it's totally fine. Cashews and pecans, also okay. Cashews frozen are delicious, are such a good snack, but you can easily just swap out for coconut flakes. In fact, um, I love toasting coconut flakes and putting a little bit of salt on there. It's so tasty and such a great snack. It's something you can go toward, but don't worry about like missing out on something due to the fact that you're cutting out almonds. Last question. Oh my gosh, we almost made it, guys. This has been so fun. Okay, Marta um, says, thank you so much for all the work you do through Healthful Pursuit. I had a quick question that I haven't seen you address before. What are your thoughts on Airbon? I never know how to say that word. Uh, 30-day healthy living detox. The only things I can find online all seem anecdotal when compared to the keto diet and only from Airbon people. <laughs> Isn't that always the way of it? I uh, would love to get your own opinion on it. Thank you so much. Marta, okay. I've tried to find out what's in Airbonne products for years because I, Airbonne, whatever it's called, uh, I get a lot of questions about this brand and I don't know the ingredients. I can't find them anywhere on their website. You just pay $249 and you get all these supplements sent to your door. Okay, I'm a holistic nutritionist, which means for years studying all of this, it was drilled into my brain, whole food is best. And I've tried to deviate from that so many times thinking that I could crack the system by using some sort of magic supplement, by doing some sort of magic thing. And I always get back to the truth for myself anyway, and my body, whole food is always best. If I have the decision between spending $249 
At least that's what it was when I looked up the research to prepare for this episode. $249 on a 30-day supply of supplements. Or I have a choice to go to a farmer's market or get a couple more seeds from my garden and make my own food or get some really good high-quality meats and some beautiful kale and some coconut oil and I'm going to make a feast. I'm always going to choose the whole foods. That's all like always. If that doesn't resonate with you, you're probably in the wrong place because I will always recommend food as opposed to supplements. Always, always. And this isn't just for physical health. It's also your energetic health, sitting with live foods and creating these foods in your kitchen with your family, turning on some music, enjoying the preparation of this puts your energy into that meal. And you know, when you create a beautiful meal and you sit down and you're in love and light and you're just like surrounded with this experience and you're eating, you don't get that from a bagged supplement, blah, 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 green shake supposed to do the same thing as kale the energy's out of it. Like it's just not the same. Okay. And this is why when we are in places where I can get fresh spinach, I'm always going to add the fresh spinach to my smoothie as opposed to a greens powder, even though the greens powder has XYZ supplement and XYZ this and one, two, three, that when it comes down to it, I know Um, without a doubt that my body prefers whole foods, clean ingredients more than anything. And I just don't feel as alive when I'm using foods that come out of packages. That's a personal choice. I've seen it with many of my clients, take it or leave it. But that's my approach on it all. Wow, this was fun. If you want me to answer one of your questions, I would love to do so. You can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash contact, submit one of your questions. Would love to answer it on an upcoming show. Next up on the podcast, we have Sunday, June 7th, episode 252. My friend Debbie Potts is coming on the show to guide you on whether you have athletic stress. Then Sunday, June 14th, we have episode 253. I'm sharing the keto supplements that I don't go without. Um, We're going to be talking about whole food sources, um, supplement based, when to know you don't need a supplement, when to know it might be beneficial to supplement, how to find those in real foods, and so much more. So I will see you there. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor should it be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.